The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. This webinar on data security compliance challenges and how to overcome them. I'm Alan Calder. I'm the uh, CEO of IT Governance Limited. Uh, I'm going to be your host for today. This webinar is going to be about an hour long in total, about 45 or 50 minutes of uh, me sharing information with you and then uh, five or 10 minutes as the time allows for Q&A at the end of it. So um, I'm the founder of IT Governance which I set up about uh, 10 or 12 years ago because I believed the market needed to have a, a supplier that could integrate the whole range of products and tools that management's needed to tackle cybersecurity. So uh, we're a single source for everything to do with the governance of IT, cyber risk management, IT compliance. Uh, the first book which I wrote, The International Guide to Data Security, was published originally in 2002. It's now in it's sixth edition, it's the Open University textbook, and our business in the United States is um, delivered primarily through itgovernanceusa.com, uh, which is a uh, website uh, which provides products and services in the United States. Uh, we have uh, people in uh, New York and elsewhere in the uh, US and um, uh, looking for how we can help organizations meet the complex set of compliance challenges that there are. Our business is built very strongly around uh, cyber resilience, data protection, uh, and the new European regulation, which extends to the rest of the world, GDPR, um, is one of our major areas, as are cybersecurity and ISO 27001. But we also deal with uh, PCI, incident response, uh, business continuity management, penetration testing, uh, and the range of uh, uh, ITIL. Uh, current state of uh, cyber risk. Gartner says in a recent report that by 2020, 30% of global 2000 companies will have been directly compromised by cyber activists or cyber criminals, directly compromised. Global ransomware, cyber center, cybersecurity ventures, uh, believes global ransomware damage costs will increase, increase over the next two years to $5 billion, whereas the cost of a data breach in the US has already hit an all time high of 7.35 uh, million. The average cost of a data breach in the Poneman cost of data breach study. That same study says that malicious or criminal attacks are the primary uh, source of attacks, the most costly, according to survey of all cybersecurity incidents. So it's not just error and human error, it's malicious or criminal attacks. And 74% of organizations feel vulnerable to insider threats, but weirdly only 42% feel they have the appropriate controls in place to prevent an insider attack. You would have thought that if your vulnerability is inside the threats, you might have done something about it. So the cyber risk landscape is a uh, very complex one with a wide range of threats and a lot of organizations feeling themselves to be at risk. The leading causes of data breaches, 75% of data breaches according to Verizon are perpetrated by outsiders. This is the uh, most recent, the 2017 data breach investigation report. 51% of breaches involved organized criminal groups, 25% involved um, internal uh, actors. Uh, and the reality is, of course, that most organized crime have very sophisticated uh, criminal capabilities, uh, and the challenge for organizations is making sure you know how to deal with them. The most common tactic, 62% of attacks featured hacking, 51% uh, of the breaches included malware, 81% uh, of hacking related breaches leveraged either stolen or otherwise compromised passwords, 43% were uh, social attacks, 14% uh, were errors or privilege misuse, which uh, caused 14% of breaches and 8% of physical actions were the cause. So it's not physical attacks that's the issue, it's online uh, breaches that are a real problem. And as I'm talking, if you find yourself wanting to ask questions or explore any of the issues I'm doing, please do use the questions function in the um, uh, GoToWebinar panel on your screen. Uh, 
uh, if you click on the button, you can type questions in there. When we come to the end of the outbound portion of this webinar, what I'll do is I'll pick up uh, questions that are in the queue in the question section. I'll read the questions out and then uh, come up with an answer for you. So do feel free to use the questions function if you want to pose questions or challenge any of the facts which um, are coming up here in this uh, webinar. So the most common tactics, all primarily, as you would imagine, driven by uh, criminals, uh, online attacks, and hey, why wouldn't you, uh, if you can uh, attack somebody from a remote location and remove very large sums of money without taking any physical risk, why wouldn't you do that? It's hardly surprising that over the last 20 years, physical transgressions by organized crime have gone down to such a significant extent. When you look at the threat landscape, what you can see is a link between threat actors, the attack vectors, and the threat types, as well as the kind of assets which uh, are at risk. So, an organisation has a um, an organisation has outside of it a number of threat actors. There are non-target specific. Most organisations at risk from software attacks, which are not focused on you as a specific target. They're focused on looking for vulnerabilities, and the exploration and identification of vulnerabilities means that they can be exploited. Threat actors include employees, either while currently employed or post-employment. This could be because they, uh, they're malicious, they want to do harm, or because they want to steal information, or because they get about to go and work for a competitor, or are working now for a competitor. Employees are a threat actor, terrorists obviously a threat actor, uh, not necessarily focused on individual organizations, but perhaps on critical national infrastructure or uh, deploying malware, which can um, create problems for wide numbers of organizations. Hacktivists are another a pretty typical threat actor, individuals who want to, for political or other reasons, deface, destroy, take offline particular target websites. Organized crime, as I mentioned, a, a significant part of the threat landscape. Organized criminals have uh, uh, crafted um, malware, they have support desks, they have access to very well organized uh, mechanisms and frameworks for attacking target organizations. Of course, uh, nation states deploying uh, their own armies. We see quite a lot of that in the news uh, recently. We see claims made that uh, Russia deployed a particular uh, form of malware. We see claims that America, Iran, and that other countries all deploy different types of online uh, malware or or other attack software in order to uh, take down or influence activities in, in other nation states. Competitors are, a, are an issue. Competitors are going to be focused on you rather than on everybody else, uh, looking to create opportunity or to, to uh, discombobulate uh, you. And then, of course, there are natural disasters, just because uh, you think you're secure against all of the different types of attacks doesn't necessarily make you secure from a major system outage, from a major natural disaster, which means that the data centers are taken offline. Uh, all of those are threat actors. A threat actor is a uh, individual or entity, event, occurrence, uh, which might or might not uh, attack an organization. And attacks come through vectors. Uh, what we talk about as vectors is vectors, the channel, if you like, through which an attack can be mounted. And typically, the attack vectors are people, processes, and technology. So, uh, employees, external employees, might be looking to exploit a, uh, a relationship with other staff or exploit a relationship uh, with people in terms of social engineering. Uh, terrorists might be uh, planning to take advantage of technological inadequacies and deploy a, a technology bomb that's going to uh, take out a particular piece of infrastructure. So, threat actors, depending on their motivation, uh, will look at how they can act in particular vectors uh, to deploy particular types of threats. Threats range from malware, web attacks, uh, denial of service attacks through social engineering, human, in, human error, ransomware, and of course, system failures. All of these threat types can be deployed by uh, different threat actors. They can be deployed in different ways through each of those attack vectors. And they're focused on very specific sets of 
uh, assets. So an attack isn't necessarily trying to steal a particular asset from you. What it might be doing is saying, actually, oh, we're after intellectual property, or it might be if it's a non-target specific attack, it gets into the secure area and discovers there's a whole bunch of intellectual property that's worth stealing, or there's card data or personally identifiable information, uh, might give access to money, being able to uh, exploit the fact that an email uh, system, your technology infrastructure is not encrypted to mount a man in the middle attack uh, might mean that as an organization you can uh, access bank account details and steal money from organizations. Reputation is a target, often that's a target of, uh, of nation states and competitors. Uh, commercial information is valuable to organized crime just as much as it is to competitors. So threat targets can vary. Uh, you can sometimes find that a, uh, a hacktivist who takes advantage of a weakness in processes to uh, display deploy a social engineering attack is able to steal intellectual property, commercial information, and damage reputation. So targets uh, can vary quite a lot, but as an organization in terms of thinking about cybersecurity, you're thinking about how do I protect all of those targets against those threat types coming in through those vectors, and how do I understand the motivations of those who might be acting against me? So. Human awareness. Last Friday, Snapchat's payroll department was targeted by an isolated email phishing scam in which a scammer impersonated our chief executive officer and asked for employee payroll information. This is according to TechCrunch published on uh, Leap February the 29th last year. Unfortunately, the phishing email wasn't recognized for what it was, a scam, and payroll information about some current and former employees was disclosed externally. Similarly, Ubiquiti Network sent a payment of $46.7 million in June 2015 after an email was sent impersonating its chief executive officer. We as an organization see those kind of emails coming in on a regular basis, uh, apparently coming from me to our finance team saying, hi, uh, can you make a transfer an amount of money to the Philippines for a key supplier? We're just signing up. Uh, our finance team, of course, are aware that I'm never going to say that, so those kind of emails tend to get dealt with as phishing emails from the outset. But the human awareness factor is critical to being able to deal with these types of attacks. Uh, attackers are going to mount attacks through whatever the simplest looking route is. They're not looking for a difficult, challenging time. They want simple, straightforward attack uh, opportunities. So those vectors that can be exploited most quickly are the ones they're going to exploit. And that's the background against which regulators are increasingly thinking about how they force organizations to properly address cybersecurity. In the United States, there's no common uh, uh, data security law, which applies across all of the, uh, all of the states. Uh, but there is, in each individual state, a uh, number of regulations beginning to appear, which reflect the growing global regulatory concern about cybersecurity and protecting personal data. In terms of where federal and state laws might no common data security law, I mean, there isn't something like the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a federal law which applies to all data processing in all sectors and industries across the whole of the United States. What you do have are federal and state laws. So federal laws like HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, applies to uh, covered entities in the healthcare space. The uh, uh, Graham Leach Bliley Act applies to uh, financial sector organizations, a particular subsector of the finance sector, Federal Trade Commission, the Telecommunications, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the SEC regulation around the privacy of consumer financial information. All, all are regulations which organizations, if those if you're in their sector, have to deal with. In the in New York, the New York Department of Financial Services Cybersecurity Regulation applies to financial services companies that have to that are that are, that are registered in uh, in New York. And the proposed New York Data Security Act would impose on all organizations in New York an obligation to put in place appropriate cybersecurity and offer uh, certifications like ISO 27001 as a, an appropriate safe harbor to demonstrate that uh, you've taken appropriate actions to meet the requirements of the Act. Internationally, as I've mentioned, the EU General Data Protection Regulation has uh, 
traction across the world because of the requirement that organizations outside the European Union providing services into it uh, should comply with it. And those services, whether paid or unpaid, uh, and for US organizations seeking to comply with the extraterritoriality uh, concerns of GDPR registration under the EU US Privacy Shield is a way of doing that. Also in the European Union, the Directive on Security of Network and Information Systems uh, is, uh, is applicable to entities outside, uh, based outside the European Union but operating within it. And the, uh, for instance, China's PRC network security law also purports to apply internationally. And we're seeing increasingly uh, uh, national players looking at how they can project cybersecurity law beyond their uh, national boundaries on the basis that the internet is a global uh, channel and that organizations anywhere else in the world can be collecting the data of their citizens and residents and therefore they're looking for ways to make sure that that data is appropriately protected. So the NY uh, DFS, the um, uh, 23 NY CRR 500, uh, the core requirements are that the organization has to implement an overall cybersecurity uh, program. And the reason why we're uh, running this webinar, of course, tonight is that February the 15th, 2018, is the date on which organizations who are subject to it have to submit their first certificate of compliance and we're hoping that lots and lots of organizations are well in a position to do that. Implementing an overall cybersecurity program with cybersecurity policies, uh, appointing appropriately qualified cybersecurity uh, personnel, uh, having applied limited access privileges across the organization's network and develops an instant response plan. Those are all the core requirements which have to be in place by today. By March the First, uh, the uh, requirements are that uh, the organization has appointed a chief information security officer, is uh, able to evidence that it's taking appropriate steps to train and monitor personnel, it's conducting regular penetration testing and vulnerability assessments, it's uh, got a proper cyber risk assessment process in place, and it's deployed multi-factor authentication across the organization. So not much of a gap between February the 1st and March, so between February the 15th and March the 1st, but quite a gap in terms of the range of things that have to be in place within the next couple of weeks. You've got slightly longer until August this year to have a proper audit trail in place to, place to be able to uh, apply effective information security at the application level to have proper limitations around data retention which you're actioning in uh, the sense that you're not keeping data beyond its data retention point and non-public information is all properly encrypted to a standard like FIPS 140-2. As part of uh, as a far part of the final stage, a third party service provider security policy has to be in place by March the 1st, 2019. So a number of very specific requirements in the NYDFS that ought to lead to a significant improvement in the level of cybersecurity for uh, New York headquartered financial service uh, organizations. C clients sometimes say to us, what's the difference between cybersecurity and information security? At one level, you might say, well, there isn't much of a difference. Uh, whatever gets the uh, C-suite to spend money is uh, the best word to call it. Uh, if you want to be particularly technical, you might say that cybersecurity is the technologies, processes, and measures that are designed to protect individuals and organizations from cybercrime. So effective cybersecurity would reduce the risk of a cyber attack through the deliberate exploitation of systems, networks, and technologies. In other words, cybersecurity is about protecting yourself against uh, primarily digital attacks. Information security is about the protection of information and information systems from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, destruction, in order to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that data. Quite often, cybersecurity is seen as a component of information security. In other words, information security might include physical security measures. Cybersecurity tends to look only at the uh, digital or online uh, security measures.
as I said, there are other organizations who simply say, well, uh, whatever gets us to spend money uh, is what we'll call it. Uh, the key thing is we need to be protecting data in a way that enables the organization to trade effectively. So what does good security look like? Based on now some 15 years worth of uh, writing about information security, of working with clients in all sorts of sectors and uh, of all sorts, uh, and having a, a very good sense of what is practical inside an organization as distinct from uh, uh, what is theoretically interesting, the, the answer is it's almost certainly not an investment in a very expensive piece of technology. Good security starts with board leadership, support and commitment. Uh, the reason why the business, for instance, is called IT governance is a recognition that cybersecurity, information security should be part of the governance imperative of an organization, should be driven by the board, the CEO should be personally accountable, uh, the uh, board framework should ensure that cybersecurity is audited on a regular basis. It should involve the whole organization. Uh, if you think about the cyber threat landscape, one of the vectors is people, another vector is processes, so weaknesses in processes on the periphery of the organization, weaknesses with people in a remote location is still going to give an attacker a way into the heart of the organization. So it should involve the entire organization. You should be identifying and assessing vulnerabilities across the whole organization. You should be putting in place appropriate controls wherever they need to be inside the organization. The deployment of controls, though, shouldn't be simply a, here's a set of controls, we must deploy them all. Reality is businesses exist to take risks. Uh, information security is an area of risk. And it's highly appropriate that the organization should make its decisions about what it's going to do in terms of information security risk on the basis of a risk assessment. And a proper risk assessment is going to be built around what the business is trying to achieve, what is prepared to invest in cybersecurity, what types of exposures is prepared to take. And that should mean that two organizations operating in a similar sector of a similar size won't necessarily have exactly the same cybersecurity uh, framework or exactly the cy same cybersecurity uh, risk assessment and decisions about controls. Obviously, given that uh, people, process, and technology are the major vectors, your risk assessment should look at risks in each of those main areas of the business and should be looking to protect all data, not just personal data. And this is a message which is true about financial sector information or uh, personally identifiable information. It's about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all information uh, from blueprints all the way through to the uh, date of birth of the chief executive. A management system, good security should be subject to regular reviews, should be continually improved. Whatever you're doing now, which while it might be adequate now, is not going to be adequate in three months or six months' time. There are going to be attacks which beat your defenses. There are going to be new vulnerabilities which are identified and explored uh, by attackers. And that means that your security system needs to continue evolving, needs to be continue needs continually to be driven by uh, identifying new ways of dealing with both old uh, threats and with new threats. So regular reviews, continued improvement, uh, preferably audited by an external entity, uh, a certificate of compliance from an external or third party certification body uh, is a way of being able to demonstrate to stakeholders, including to the C-suite, that the organization isn't just saying it's got itself to a good state in terms of information security, it genuinely is. Obviously, a good information security management system is going to include incident monitoring, uh, logging of incidents, logging of activity, building of records, and planning for how you're going to respond if and when there is a cyber breach. Where you can identify best practice, you'd deploy it. And if you're looking for certification or specification, you'd want to apply internationally accepted uh, best practice, not least because that probably means you can access guidance and tools about how to use an internationally accepted standard. So good security, and we find this now across more and more sectors, more and more countries, more and more um, uh, organizations of different sizes, that's pretty well what good security looks like. 
and good security is encapsulated in an information security management system or, or ISMS. And ISMS is a system of processes, documents, technology, people that helps an organization manage, monitor, audit, improve its information security. Everything is in one place. Everything is managed through a connected uh, set of processes. You kill off the compliance silos, which mean that you have vulnerabilities in the instances between silos. You create a single integrated management system. There is a standard, an internationally recognized standard that sets out how you can do that. It's ISO IEC 27001, the most recent version of which was published in 2013. It's the international standard for best practice in information security management. And certification by an external certification body or registration provides an independent expert assessment, assessment of the extent to which your information security management system complies with that recognized best practice specification. It's the only standard that exists that does this. It's the only internationally recognized uh, data security specification. Uh, it's uh, the reason, therefore, that ISO 27001 certifications are growing globally at about 20% a year. And we expect to see within the next five to seven years uh, well over a million companies uh, achieving ISO 27001 certification. That's the current uh, trend. You can see the increasing number of uh, certifications. It's on an upward trend since 2006, um, accelerating uh, quite uh, quickly. Uh, what we see happening with standards like ISO 27001 is there comes uh, an inflection growth, an inflection point where the number of companies that are certified and therefore turning to their supply chains and saying, please get certified, uh, becomes sufficient that the growth in certifications turns up. And it looks as though uh, that's begun happening uh, ever since uh, around about 2013. So the uh, global growth rate has begun to turn up over the last couple of years, uh, now running at about 33,000 uh, organizations. As I said, over the next five to seven years, uh, that compound angle growth rate will, will undoubtedly accelerate. In the US, uh, there's been a very substantial uh, upturn. So it went up very quickly in 2014 to 1,200, dropped off a bit thereafter. Um, there were uh, organizations that discovered they weren't getting the benefit from it or whether certification was inappropriate. Uh, so there's been a drop off, but that overall rate of growth you will see picking up again in uh, 2016 and 2017. These figures uh, don't come right up to date because they're based on a survey. And the most recent data is uh, the 2016 survey carried out in 2017. Um, and therefore, uh, we're not going to see more uh, up-to-date data for quite a while yet. That's the current state of play. So I talked about an ISMS. What is a management system? A management system is a way that an organization can go about uh, organizing and managing itself, can organize uh, and go about how it goes about managing what it's doing in a particular uh, area. So. Um, uh, across an organization dealing with information security, it's likely to affect, for instance, HR, IT, uh, sales, production, operations. They're all going to need to be dealing in one way or another with information security. And if you're going to have a consistent and coherent approach to it, then an information management system enables you to do that. What a, a management system standard does is it creates a set of specified repeatable steps that an organization can put in place and follow uh, that creates an organizational culture that becomes one of continual self-evaluation, um, corrective action, improvement, uh, driving through employment or employee awareness and driven by management, uh, proper leadership to create an organization which increasingly uh, is resilient to the range of cyber attacks and cyber threats that we've been looking at. So a management system is going to be uh, relevant to a particular context. Uh, if you're going to build a management system, it's not a one size fits all. Um, a financial services business operating in New York will have different requirements around information security than a uh, cloud service provider 
organization operating in New York. Uh, different laws might apply, different customer requirements. So context is the first thing that an organization has to get clear in thinking about an ISMS. Leadership is essential. You're not going to make any progress in creating an information security or any other form of management system without clear leadership from the top. And that doesn't just mean leadership, it means planning, it means a project plan, it means a commitment of time and money and resources, both in terms of expertise, potentially uh, extra people, uh, potentially deployment of people from across the business to get involved in the creation and um, growth development and management of the management system. Having designed and implemented a management system, it needs to operate. So again, that requires resource, it requires, it has to become part of business as usual. It has to have performance measures that enable you to determine whether or not you're achieving your business objectives. And so obviously the performance measures for the information security management system should link very clearly to the uh, performance measures for the business as a whole. Uh, so, for instance, you might say that one of the objectives of the business is to uh, win more customers, that you recognize that uh, customers are concerned about the security of their data. So, the decision to pursue an ISO 27001 certification might be to win more customers. And so, you'd link the number of customers you win on the basis of security to the investment in your cybersecurity program. And of course, you're going to build a continually improving culture around that. ISO 27001 has those kinds of requirements set out in the main body of the standard. Uh, the main body of the standard is essentially um, uh, uh, eight clauses um, would set out exactly what an organization has to do, uh, clauses four through uh, 10, and that's supported by a set of uh, controls. Annex A to the standard has 14 sets of controls, 110 individual controls spread amongst those. And it's not usually expected that an organization will implement every single one of the controls because, because if you remember, controls should be selected on the basis of an information security risk assessment. So the controls start off with A5. The A simply means it's, a, it's an annex uh, uh, it's an annex document, uh, five, because um, that links to clause five of OSA 27002, which is where there is more detailed guidance on how to implement the control. Annex uh, A5 is information security policies. Uh, A6 is a set of controls around how information security can be organized and looks at, for instance, roles and responsibilities inside the organization. A7 is the set of controls dealing with uh, human resources. So it looks at what you should be doing before, during, and after employment, pre-employment screening, uh, staff awareness training, and post-termination um, closure of accounts, for instance, are the types of controls which you'd find in uh, A7. A8 looks at asset management, and assets are both uh, business processes uh, as well as data and the underlying hardware applications, operating systems, and so on that support them. And quite often, controls have to be deployed at an asset level. Uh, A7 talks about how you can identify and manage assets, how you can secure assets, but also looks at the logic that when you're buying and deploying assets, uh, you should be thinking about uh, what security requirements might be. And that links very obviously, therefore, as you'll see in a minute, to A14. A9 is a key set of controls. It's dealing with access control. And obviously, data can be compromised if somebody can access it. So the controls in A9 are particularly important. They're about determining who should have access to what data, um, how to put in place appropriate uh, mechanisms, per, starting with uh, access to uh, the organization, its systems, and then coming down perhaps to access at an application level or access at an individual uh, data level. A10 deals with cryptography. Uh, more and more organizations should be encrypting uh, mobile devices, encrypting databases, encrypting uh, data in flight because, hey, if somebody can't access the data, you can't have a data breach. Uh, most of the uh, serious data breaches there have been in answer to the question, was the data encrypted, came the answer, um, um, um. So cryptography is the controls around making sure the data is secured through encryption uh, and that your uh, encryption keys are managed properly. 
Physical environmental security dealt with in A11, uh, that's dealing with everything from social engineering through to uh, power, lighting, uh, and related controls. It's making sure that the physical environment and the physical assets are properly secure. A12 and A13 are two control sets which operate alongside one another. They are the operations uh, and communication security controls operations is what the IT team and security team is doing. Uh, the communication security is around how uh, technologies are deployed and secured and A14 deals with the uh, identification of security requirements at the point you're acquiring and deploying systems. A15 is beginning to look at supplier relationships and security and supplier relationships. A uh, very helpful set of controls in terms of the upcoming requirement from NYDFS to build a um, supply chain uh, security management program. A16 recognizes that you're going to be breached. However good you think your security is, you're going to be breached. And so it makes sense to have a proper information security incident management program. Uh, staff trained how to report stuff, how to escalate it, how to respond if there is a breach. And of course, uh, business continuity may be relevant if you think that uh, losing uh, the organization because of a natural disaster, then you're going to build a business continuity plan. And inside your business continuity plan, there will be information security components and aspects. A17 looks at what those might be. And finally, A18, uh, if you like, closes the circle. It recognizes that one of the key drivers for cybersecurity is compliance. And so it's a control set which involves identifying all of the regulations with which you have to comply and determining in a structured way what the appropriate controls are to put in place to enable you to meet those compliance requirements. So it's a very comprehensive control set in Annex A. Uh, most organizations out of the 114 controls in Annex A will find that it's appropriate to implement uh, somewhere between 90 uh, and perhaps about 105 of them. So that's an information security management system. Those are uh, those are the controls. What are the benefits? What all benefits do organizations get out of using an information security specification like ISO 27001? Well, the first benefit is that uh, because it's a specification, it's a uh, regulation, a specific sector agnostic specification, which can be linked to every every single data protection regulation. It enables you by uh, achieving compliance with ISO 27001 to effectively put in place a compliance program that will help you meet multiple compliance requirements simultaneously. That should mean that rather than being audited or auditing yourself against multiple regulatory frameworks, you can simply audit yourself against ISO 27001, having made sure that the specific requirements of each of those frameworks is integrated into your uh, ISMS. That can be very much more cost effective, very much less confusing for the business. It also will mean that you don't need to take other information security steps. It's all part of the same set of activities. This usually will help you meet contractual requirements around ISO 27001. Increasingly, we see RFQs and RFPs having uh, attached to the multiple pages of information security questionnaire, most of which you can deal with by simply attaching a copy of your ISO 27001 certificate. From a C-suite point of view, it's a terrific benefit to be able to have a independent verification of the management system. It means you're not reliant on just your IT team telling you you're secure. You've got an independent party doing it. And, and if an independent party finds loopholes that the, the IT team didn't, well, that's a good opportunity for the IT team to improve and learn uh, and the organization's overall secure, security posture improves. And that demonstration to customers, regulators, uh, suppliers, and the board is a key part of what information assurance is about, that the measures you've taken are appropriate for the identified risk. They're working, they're helping the business achieve its objectives. And the fact that they help the business achieve its objectives means that they become part of the business culture, driving improvements in the security culture and processes, which over the long run should improve the organization's uh, reputation, enhance its competitive advantage, and put in a position where it can both more cost effectively than its competitors, but also in a more regularly compliant way, make headway in a world which is becoming increasingly um, uh, 
built around requirements in terms of uh, regulation and um, and particularly regulation around data protection. So ISO 27001 is an area which uh, we in IT governance have been involved in since before ISO 27001 existed. The very first company that was certified as complying with BS 7799, which was the forerunner to ISO 27001, my colleague Steve Watkins and I were the uh, respectively the uh, information security manager and chief executive of, um, and we've been involved therefore with information security management and ISO 27001 longer than anybody else uh, in the world. We've contributed to and been involved in the development of the ISO 27001 standard. We've probably got a deeper and more comprehensive working knowledge of how to meet those compliance objectives. And therefore, the products and services we offer are going to be more insightful and more useful than just about anything else that might be available on the market. We have ISO 27001 training courses, both for lead implementers and for lead auditors, running them online, plus in uh, Boston and New York over the next months. Uh, we have a gap analysis consultancy service. We can come and spend time with the clients and identify the areas in which uh, you're not yet compliant with the requirements of 27001, out of which we can map a uh, implementation plan. We can give you uh, books and tools that help you with implementation. We've got comprehensive sets of document libraries that are customizable. And of course, in one of our subsidiary companies, Vigilant Software, we've got the leading ISO 27001 risk assessment tool which you can deploy uh, in a way that when you've identified your risks, it will uh, populate uh, documentation from our documentation toolkit and simplify very substantially the process towards uh, getting a best practice information security management system in place. We uh, we talk about our, uh, our information security lead implementer and foundation courses. They are uh, the lead implementer course is IISP, the Institute of Information Security Professionals accredited. It delivers an ISO 17024 uh, certificate, which means it's an uh, internationally recognized uh, certificate. Um, as I said, those are the courses we're delivering. Uh, all over the world and particularly from a New York point of view uh, online across the whole of the US uh, that's live online or in classrooms in Boston and New York. You can get in touch with us through all the obvious ways. You can go on to itgovernanceusa.com, uh, email us, call us toll free on 877-317-3454. Uh, we've got a number of social media um, opportunities. You can come onto our website and arrange through an account manager to talk to one of our ISO 27001 experts. And we can genuinely help you make the kind of progress that you want to make to, uh, to get to the point where as an organization you are using ISO 27001 in a way that makes the organization cost effectively compliant with that multiple set of data security regulations. So ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the end of uh, what I had prepared to say. Uh, I'm now happy to answer any questions on this or related subjects that you may have. Uh, if you haven't already, the question function inside the GoToWebinar uh, panel is where you type your questions in. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, read them out um, and um, I will um, I'll share the question, I'll tell you what I think the answer to that question is, and I'll take the questions obviously in the order that they've come. So if you've got questions, you haven't asked them, please do uh, do so. Um, first question, how close are we to a common data security law in the US? Um, well, there's a difficult question. Uh, Congress very regularly, year after year, sees uh, data security laws proposed. Um, they uh, have a lot of conversation about them, uh, and year after year they uh, they fall over. A common data security law uh, at a relatively weak level is more possible than a common data security law at a European Union level, because the U.S. has a much greater uh, uh, institutional belief that the data of citizens should be accessible for the purpose of uh, fighting crime, uh, for dealing with terrorism, uh, and for other, other areas that the uh, European Commission believes doesn't automatically give authorities the right to access personal data. So even if the United States has its own uh, federal data protection law, uh, unless it 
is put in at a level of security which the US government currently doesn't believe in, it's unlikely to be something which meets the requirement for the European Union. And that means that for the foreseeable future, the only way in which uh, companies in the uh, enterprises, entities in the US can uh, comply with European data protection law is really through the EU US privacy shield. Uh, registering with that, uh, is the uh, logical thing to do. It's, it's onerous, it's a self-certification process, but uh, failing to, uh, but self-certifying, knowing that you're not in compliance is itself uh, going to obviously generate some major problems. So uh, I don't believe we're very close to it. Are there predefined def predefined specific documents for ISO 27001 compliance? Yes, there are. Um, there are not that many. There are only about six or eight documents that you have to have. Uh, an information security policy is one example of a document which you have to have. Uh, you have to have a uh, uh, audit plan. Um, uh, pretty well thereafter, the documents you have to have are those which are necessary for you to ensure that the management system is working as you want it to work. One of the important things to say about ISA 27001 is it is implicit in the standard that the level of documentation an organization deploys should be appropriate to the scale and complexity of the business. So a small business shouldn't have much in the way of documentation. We've helped a company as small as two people get ISA 27001 certification with all of its documentation in the form of a single Excel workbook. Large organization with lots of people in common complex processes will obviously need very much more substantial documentation. But you shouldn't let anybody say to you uh, that ISO 27001 is only for big organizations because it requires lots of documentation. It does not. It requires only just the right amount of documentation. What's the biggest cybersecurity threat affecting organizations that we should know? How do we protect against them? Well, um, the biggest cybersecurity threat depends on your uh, uh, on your organization. There are threats that uh, exist for which you might not have exploitable vulnerabilities. So uh, if, for instance, you have uh, an out of uh, support uh, Windows operating system, uh, your biggest threat is likely to be uh, any one of a number of variants of ransomware, which is in the in the wild, which can uh, take out whole systems very quickly. However, that particular threat isn't something you worry about if you're if you've deployed a more up-to-date in-service, in-support Microsoft operating system. So context is always going to be important. Uh, if you are a large organization operating on an international stage, then uh, organized cybercrime and nation states may be your biggest. Uh, threat actor to worry about. Uh, typically, your biggest the threat vector you worry most about is going to be people, because people weaknesses are the ones that are easiest to um, exploit. And some form of uh, social engineering attack, uh, typically combined with a number of other attacks, malware, uh, and so on, is the kind of thing that you uh, want to be worrying most about. For smaller organizations, none of that really matters. Smaller organizations are not going to be targeted by uh, nation states or uh, serious organized uh, crime. Uh, they are going to be targeted by lower level uh, standard attacks, which are looking for known vulnerabilities in known uh, applications and operating systems. And as all of those vulnerabilities are published on, uh, on, on public websites, it's not difficult for attackers to work out what to deploy. You can uh, rent that kind of software. You can trigger it and deploy it uh, remotely. It'll go out onto the internet, search for vulnerabilities, and then exploit them. And those kind of attacks are the things that should worry 70 or 80% of businesses. And if you can get yourself secure against those low level attacks, uh, in, for most organizations, that's all you need to do. Uh, for a smaller number of organizations, yes, you need to do more, but dealing with that low level of um, very prevalent internet-based attack is the first thing you should be doing. How much can a, an ISO 20, how much can uh, an ISO 27001 uh, implementation uh, be applied. Can you, you have an interval of values for a small company with 20 people? I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure I'm understanding the question. Um, 
an ISO 27001 implementation can be quite inexpensive. Uh, it means that you have to have proper processes and documentation. Uh, we have as one of our standard services Services, for instance, for small companies of 20 people or less, um, we can help implement uh, ISO 27001 in a way that's guaranteed to pass external certification for, I think, something like seven and a half or eight thousand um, dollars. And we typically can do that in less than three months. We do all the documentation, the teaching, the training, the audit, uh, on all of that kind of stuff as part of a standard. Uh, offering for a 20 company organization. That's a very popular offering for us um, uh, around the world because many small organizations see the benefit of ISO 27001 compliance. They just don't have the resources to do it. And this is a package which we can put in place and we can then uh, equally well maintain it for you very cost effectively um, thereafter. So uh, very scalable, a much bigger organization is going to cost substantially more. Uh, we have one client uh, where we're working on ISO 27001 implementation. Uh, we're 18 months into a, a three-year program. Uh, they're a global organization with businesses in many countries, a uh, very complex set of business processes. So building information security into their processes is a complex undertaking. And that's the reality of business of information security. It's got to be scaled to meet the needs and requirements of different organizations. Uh, um, so another question, what's the link between GDPR and ISO 27001? Um, well, um, uh, GDPR says that organizations have to take appropriate uh, measures to protect the rights and freedoms of data subjects, having considered all of the risks. And that's exactly what ISO 27001 does. It enables an organization to carry out a risk assessment in relation to uh, data subjects, choose appropriate controls and put them in place. So ISO 27001 is a very effective way of demonstrating that an organization is complying with the requirements of ISO 27001. And then uh, perhaps this is the last question. It's a similar question, but in relation to NYDFS, how does, N how does ISO 27001 help with NYDFS compliance requirements? Well, the answer is that ISO 27001 specification maps very specifically to the NYDFS uh, regulation. There's a green paper you can download from our website, uh, itgovernanceusa.com, which tells you exactly how ISO 27001 does that. And the benefit is that, you know, it's not, it, there isn't a framework where you can get audited externally to NYDFS, but there is a framework, uh, a, a very substantial framework of uh, certification bodies or registrars that can audit you against ISO 27001. And so if you're faced with trying to demonstrate that you're compliant with NYDFS, the fact that you can point at an ISO 27001 audit is a very effective method of demonstrating the extent to which you've gone to meet your compliance requirements. Ladies and gentlemen, unless there are any more questions, I have the sense that uh, we are coming to the end of our time together today. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for joining us on this webinar. There is a program of webinars coming up over the next few months. If you go to itgovernanceusa.com, you'll be able to see what those are. Uh, do share those webinars with people you know. If there are others who you think could benefit from uh, the work we're doing to uh, make available knowledge and information around uh, cybersecurity management, please do share them with others. We're very happy to do that for um, as many people as we can. The truth of cybersecurity is that we're only secure as the weakest link in our supply chain. And so getting our supply chains cyber secure is a smart and sensible thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us this afternoon. I'd like to wish you all a, a very happy rest of the day. Good day. <laughs>